Hello everyone, I am Priyadarshni Mara, faculty at the Department of Buddhist Studies, University of Delhi. Today, I would be discussing with you module number 30, which belongs to paper number 11 of Philosophy of Buddhism. Now, this module is entitled as Madhyamik Philosophy in Mahayan Sutra and Chief Tenets of Nagarjun's Philosophy the doctrine of two truths, Pratitya Samutpad, and its relation with Madhyam Pratipad Shunyata. Now, if you see, then our topic is a little vast. We have chief tenets of Nagarjun's philosophy, where we would be focusing on the doctrine of two truths, Pratitya Samutpad, as well as its relation with Madhyam Pratipad Shunyata. So, now let me just give you a brief introduction first, then we will go into two truths, then into the doctrine of dependent arising or Pratiti Samutpad, and after that we would be talking about its relationship with Shunyata. So, Madhyam Pratipad or the middle way, when we use this term Madhyam Pratipad, we are pointing out to middle way. Madhyam means middle, Pratipad means way. So, Madhyam Pratipad or the middle way is the characterization given by the Buddha to his philosophical doctrine. Evolving on the lines of Buddha's middle way, Nagarjun seized upon this Madhyam mark and hence termed his philosophical paradigm to be Madhyamit or Madhyamev. Madhyamakam and the source of it came to be known as Madhyamik Shastra. So, the followers of this system were named as Madhyamiks. In the true sense of the term, this philosophical aspect avoids the two extremes. So, when we talk about the Madhyam mark, why are we using this term middle way? There must be something that we are avoiding in order to be called middle way. So, the two extreme notions or extreme extremities that were upheld during Nagarjun's time or during Buddha's time, these two extremities are avoided and the Madhyam mark or middle path is being held. And the two extreme positions are that of substantialism and nihilism, what we call Shashvadvad and Uchedvad. Substantialism refers to seeing the world in a solid form as here and now, whereas when we talk about nihilism, it refers to the world as purely an illusion. So, Without actually getting into the extreme of either seeing the world in a solid form as here and now or without considering the world as purely an illusion, Buddha, Sakyamuni Buddha, treaded the middle path or propounded the middle path and Nagarjun picks up that middle path and further brings about exposition of his doctrine which is known as Madhyamik. Therefore, he brings out the critical evaluation of substantialism and nihilism and formulates the middle path avoiding these two extremes, stating the constant flow of phenomenal existence which is endowed with arising and passing away of all its constituents. Nagarjun's philosophical theory clearly identifies a separate turn in the history, denying certain most fundamental philosophical assumptions. And what were these assumptions? Among these assumptions are the existence of stable substance, the linear and one directional movement of causation, the atomic individuality of persons, the belief in a fixed identity or selfhood and the strict separations between good and bad conduct and the blessed and fettered life. 
So these were the prominent assumptions which Nagarjun denies and picks up a middle path. These assumptions were, I'm repeating them again, they were the existence of stable substances, the linear and one directional movement of causation, the atomic individuality of persons, the belief in a fixed identity or selfhood, and the strict separation between good and bad conduct and the blessed and fettered life. All such assumptions are called into fundamental question by Nagarjun's unique perspective which is grounded in the insight of emptiness or shunita, a concept which does not mean non-existence or nihilism. All that shunita points out to is that abhav, which is but rather the lack of autonomous existence. Denial of autonomy, according to Nagarjun, does not leave us with a sense of metaphysical or existential privation, a loss of some hoped-for independence and freedom, but instead offers us sense of liberation through demonstrating the interconnectedness of all things, including human beings and the manner in which human life unfolds in the natural and social worlds. Nagarjun's central concept of emptiness or shunyata of all things, which pointed to the incessantly changing and the so never fixed nature of all phenomena. When we talk about Nagarjun's shunyata, when we talk about Prathiti Samutpad, when we talk about the two truths, when we talk about samsara and nirvan, we see that they are all interconnected. The theories of two truths points out to the conventional reality and the ultimate reality, which further is the characteristic of samsara and nirvan. When we talk about shunyata, we see that it is present in the entire phenomenal existence. And when we talk about shunyata as seen from the absolute point of view, then absolute is also shunya. So you see that there is a very strong interrelation between all these philosophical aspects of Nagarjuna. They are closely knit together in order to tell us that the entire phenomenal existence is conditioned and impermanent. Now, when we come to the first part of this title, we see that we need to talk about the two truths. What are these two truths? There are two kinds of realities according to Nagarjun. That is the conventional reality which we term as Samvriti and the ultimate reality which we term as Parmarth. The term conventional truth describes everything that we perceive in our current state. We can say that the physical world exists, so this is conventionally or relatively true. It is relative. Why? Because the physical world does not exist permanently or independently. Everything in the phenomenal existence is impermanent and dependent on certain factors for uh, its arising, for its sustenance, as well as for its destruction. There is a continuous process of coming into being, of staying and then of disappearing. And that is totally dependent on conditions around one. There may be just one condition, but possibilities are there that many factors together bring up an individual. Similarly, when we talk about our bodies, they exist in a relative sense. But it is not lasting or independent, so it is relatively real. When we talk about samriti satya, we call it to be relativity 
or relatively real because in that the entire constituents of samriti satya are dependent or related to other things around them most importantly we have this mistaken perception about ourselves and what is that mistaken perception about ourselves it is we believe our senses of self is real and lasting but it is neither real nor lasting we are very far from knowing our true identity but which does not have independent existence we are also mistakenly we believe that we have what we have perceived is real and lasting but in reality nothing can be real or lasting except for the absolute when we talk about our bodies we see that i am this i am that we use this term i me or mine so what is this i when you talk about a particular person you who are you do you have an identity of your own no you don't have any identity of your own there are certain factors that have given rise to you that are sustaining you and that will bring you to a dissolution so these factors are composite in nature and they give rise to you if you remove these factors from yourself do you really think you would still be the same not possible because if you if i remove your identity the so called identity then you would be nothing and this identity is given rise by factors that are working together once you remove those factors you are not going to be anything everything we see in our current state of consciousness is impermanent and interdependent nothing exists on its own everything that depends on causes and conditions is considered relatively real and this is what when we talk about some vritti satya or empirical truth this is what we trying to point out here first is that everything is dependent for its existence on certain other factors and everything is impermanent second that there is no thing as self because there is no essence and the third factor is that because there is no self and everything is permanently changing then holding on to these things clinging on to these things leads to suffering which is the first of the four noble truths as prescribed by the sakya muni both so this is what is samriti now when we talk about the ultimate truth we see that for nagarjun ultimate truth is the truth of enlightened clarity which does not mistake the conventional for something essential this is where emptiness comes in as nagarjun teaches that all things are empty and the understanding of this emptiness leads to a greater truth of the ways things really are of course fundamentally there is no real difference between the two realities as this truth of the highest meaning posits the that individual existence cannot be grounded outside the context of everyday experience thereby linking the two realities into one in other words a higher truth is based on conventional reality not on metaphysics when we talk about the empirical truth and the ultimate truth we see that they are related and how are they related it is only when you understand this empirical truth that you would be able to gain knowledge or the attainment of the higher truth without the understanding of the ultimate of the empirical truth there can be no understanding of the ultimate 
truth. It is more like a step, first step that you take or more like ladder. Samriti can be called a ladder for Paramarth. And we need to understand the Samriti in order to reach the top of the ladder. The empirical reality is however endowed with impermanency and conditionedness which lead to dependent nature of each and every form of phenomenal existence. This nature of empirical reality is cognized by Swabhav Shonya and that is the absence of essence or own being. When we say that the empirical reality is something which is Swabhav Shunya, we mean to say that it is absence of essence or own being and is also dependently originated, which is known as Pratitya Samutpad. So this is all about the two truths. Now coming to the next section of our topic or the title, we see that we have Pratitya Samutpad. Pratitya Samutpad means dependent origination. And it is known as Pratitya Samutpad in Sanskrit and Pratitya Samupad in Pali. It has 12 links which describe the entire phenomenal existence. When we talk about the 12 links, they are more like Bhav Chakra or the links of Bhav Chakra, causal and effect. The 12 links of dependent origination provide a detailed description on the problem of suffering as well as rebirth. And what are these factors? We see that they are ignorance, mental formation, consciousness, name and form, the six senses, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, becoming, birth, aging and death. Now the first factor of dependent arising is ignorance. It is the condition for mental formation. Then we have mental formation which acts as the condition for consciousness. Third, we have consciousness and it is the condition for name and form. Fourth, we have name and form which again acts as the condition for the six senses. Now fifth, we have the six senses which are the conditions for contact. Sixth, we have contact which is the condition for feeling. Seventh, we have feeling, which is the condition for craving. Eighth, we have craving, which acts as a condition for clinging. Ninth is clinging, which is a condition for becoming. And becoming is the tenth factor and it is the condition for birth. And birth being eleventh factor, is the condition for aging and death. And 12, we have aging and death, which again is the condition for ignorance. So you can see that there is this cycle that moves around with ignorance and ends at aging and death. And again, it begins with ignorance and ignorance would be the effect of aging and death. So this cyclic moment goes on. Through ignorance are conditioned violations, actions or karm formations. Through violational actions is conditioned consciousness. Through consciousness are conditioned mental and physical phenomena. Through mental and physical phenomena are conditioned the six sense faculties or the five physical sense organs and mind. Through these six faculties is conditioned sensorial and mental contact. Through sensorial and mental contact is conditioned sensation. Through sensation is conditioned desire or thirst.
through desire or thirst is conditioned clinging. Through clinging is conditioned the process of becoming. Through the process of becoming is conditioned birth. And through birth are conditioned decay, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. This is how life arises, exists and continues and how suffering arises. These factors may be understood as sequentially spanning over a period of three lifetimes, the past, the present and the future. In the dependent origination, if we look at all the 12 links, we see that ignorance and mental formation belong to the past life and represent the conditions that are responsible for the occurrence of this life. The following factors, namely consciousness, mental and physical phenomena, are, and the six senses, contact, sensation, desire, clinging, and becoming are the factors involved in the present life. And then we are left with the last two factors of birth, death and decay and they belong to future life. When we look therefore, when we are talking about dependent origination or Pratitya Samutpad, we see that it is the cycle or the circular ring of or wheel of phenomenal existence. And it points out to the causal and effect relationship of all the factors existing in the phenomena. When we see at this cycle or the wheel, can you actually tell the starting point or the ending point of a wheel or a circle? No. Then why do we take ignorance to be the first cause? Why not the other factors to be the first cause? And why only ignorance? There is a reason for that. Do you have any idea? Can you think what would be the possible reason for taking ignorance to be the first cause? When no one knows what the first cause is in this whole cycle. The reason for taking ignorance or avidya in Sanskrit and avidya in Pali to be the first cause is that because of this ignorance, we do not know which is the first cause. Hence, we take ignorance to be the first cause. So, is it clear now? Okay, and then one more thing. When we are talking about dependent origination or this wheel of dependent origination, we see that it moves in clockwise way. It begins with ignorance and ends at death. Again, death is the condition which gives rise to ignorance and it keeps moving in a clockwise way and it is known as anulom. Now, when you realize that the entire life or the phenomenal existence is endowed with death and suffering, you break those points you break those links and start moving in the reverse order, in anti-clockwise way. And there's a point when you remove ignorance. And that is known as patilom. So we have the clockwise movement which keeps you to the suffering of the phenomenal existence. And that is known as anulom. Then we have the anti-clockwise movement which helps you break this bound or bond of suffering and come out of this wheel of birth and rebirth. And that is known as Patilom. So the entire dependent origination is based on the idea of these 12 links, which points out the causal and effect relationship of the phenomenal existence. So till now, we've talked about the two truths, Samriti and Parmat and also about Pratitya Samutpad or Dependent Origination. Now, let's move on to the other section and that is Relationship of Pratitya Samutpad with Shunyata. So here we are going to talk about 
शून्यता हाउ शून्यता इज रिलेटेड टू दिस प्रतीति समुत्पाद विच वी जस्ट डिस्कस्ड द महायान ट्रेडिशन हैज पुट अ स्पेशल एम्फेसिस ऑन शून्यता दिस वॉज नेसेसरी इन पार्ट बिकॉज ऑफ द टेंडेंसी अमंग सर्टन अर्ली बुद्धिस्ट स्कूल्स टू असर्ट दैट देर वर एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ रियालिटी दैट वर नॉट शून्य बट विच हैड इनहेरेंट or in them inherent existence in them and that is known as own being several important buddhist philosophers dismantled these theories by arguing for the pervasiveness of shunyata in every aspect of reality and here we take nagarjun to be the most important of these philosophers who dismantled the theories by arguing for the pervasiveness of shunyata in every aspect of reality so when we talk about shunyata we see that it is all pervasive in the phenomenal existence here shunyata as i've been repeating does not mean nihilism or zero it however means that it is swabhav shunya that there is no individual essence of an individual the specific arguments are used are too complicated for us to deal with here but it is important to appreciate that the understanding absolutely everything as shunya could imply that even those things most revered by buddhists such as the arhat idol and the rules laid down in the vinay are empty so even the buddhist arhats and the texts are laid empty mahayanas tend to argue that members of the hinayan tradition were attached to their idol forms as if they were not shunya to some extent shunyata is an extension of the concepts made explicit in the three flaws what are these flaws all things being impermanent nothing can be seen as having an independent lasting form of existence and this is in essence what shunyata is all about shunyata strictly speaking can be defined as no swabhav no essence or nihi swabhav nihi is the negative prefix and swabhav is the nature or essence so there is no swabhav the concept swabhav means own being and means something like substance or essence swabhav has to do with the notion that there is a form of being which is and exists in a form that is not dependent on context is not subject of variation and has form of permanent existence as such the soul is understood in religious would have swabhav god would certainly have swabhav the platonic forms such as those described in allegory of cave would have swabhav certain abhidharma teachings would also have these concluding blocks of reality which have such swabhav but mahayan philosophers and especially nagarjun concluded that shunyata is the fundamental characteristic of reality and that swabhav could be found absolutely nowhere one of the images used to illustrate the nature of reality as understood in mahayan tradition is this swabhav according to this swabhav everything is entirely endowed with impermanency and conditionedness all such parts of reality are interdependent with each other but even the most basic parts of existence have no independent existence themselves as such to the degree that reality taken from and appears to us it is because the whole arises in an independent matrix of parts 
to whole and of the subject to object. At the end of the day, we see that there is nothing that there to grasp. The flip side of Shunyata is Pratitya Samutpad. So when we talk about the relationship of Shunyata and Pratitya Samutpad, we see that they mean the same thing but from two different perspectives. To the extent that Shunyata is a negative concept that is not Swabhav, Pratitya Samutpad is a counter part which is positive. Pratitya Samutpad is an attempt to conceptualize the nature of world as it appears to us, not as with Shunyata by saying what the world is not, but by characterizing what it is. So when we look at it, when we look at Shunyata and Pratitya Samutpad, they are more like the two sides of a coin. Shunyata points out to the absence of something. Whereas Pratitya Samutpad or dependent arising points out to the presence of something, but both of them state that this absence and this presence is endowed with suffering. When we talk about the Four Noble Truths, which forms the fundamental or the basis of Sakyamuni Buddha's philosophical paradigm, we see that the first truth states that there is suffering. So, entire phenomenal existence is endowed with this suffering. Shunita states, takes the help of Pratitya Samutpad. Pratitya Samutpad firstly states that everything is conditioned and dependent on many factors for its arising. That the life is a bhav chakra which begins with ignorance, ends at with death, again begins with ignorance and ends with death. And in between we suffer. There is a lot of pain, despair, lamentation and unhappiness. Now, Shunita says that because everything is existent on other factors for its, ex for its presence, for its arising sustenance as well as dissolution, that means nothing can be said to be existing permanently or with any substance or essence. Hence, it also states that the entire phenomenal existence is endowed with suffering. So if you see, then Pratitya Samutpad is talking about the conditionedness of the things and Shunita is saying that because of this conditionedness, you cannot say that I have an essence of my own because this I is nothing but a composite of matters which formulate this I into what it is today. You, the moment you remove these conditions, there won't be anything. For that matter, when we talk about a pot, do you think a pot comes into existence on its own? Do you think a pot can be said to have its own essence? No, pot is going to have certain characteristics and certain actions. Other than that, there is nothing. When we talk about pot, it begins with a lump of clay. This lump of clay, when molded by a potter on the wheel, forms a pot into what it is and then pot functions as a store for holding water and in different other ways. But if these are the conditions, the lump of clay, potter, water and wheel, if these factors do not perform their functions, pot cannot be said to be existing. The same way when we talk about clay, clay, lump of clay cannot be said to be there on its own. Again, that lump of clay is being given rise by certain other factors. Then when we talk about the wheel, wheel is constructed in such a way that it further helps in manufacturing pot. So you see that there is a very strong 
bounding or very strong connection between everything that exists in the phenomenal existence. You cannot say that the pot is limited to storing water. The water that it stores is further made use by certain other factors. So it's like a link. You cannot, if you break this link, there is nothing that is going to come into existence. When we talk about essence or nihi swabhav, the emptiness of essence, this is what we mean, that everything has no essence in any form. Everything is dependent on many other factors for its essence. And that is what is shunyata. And related to Pratiti Samutpad, Shunyata points out to what Pratiti Samutpad points out in a positive way. Shunyata points out in the absence of that particular thing. So when we look at this tenet of Buddhism, we see that Madhimik philosophy has conveniently and in a very profound way developed the notion of two truths which points out to the samsaric existence as well as to nirvan. Then comes the notion or the doctrine or teachings of Pratiti Samutpat. Pratiti Samutpat and then we have after that Shunyata. Shunyata is emptiness, not zero but emptiness of any sort of essence. And we, when we look at these terms or these philosophical teachings of Nagarjun, we see that they actually bring out what is really existent around us. It doesn't point out to any extreme. Rather, it states that this is what is the real nature of existence. And that is the reason it gives the middle path so as for us to avoid any sort of extreme and walk on his Madhyam Pratipad. And this is Madhyamik philosophy of Nagarjuna. Thank you.